Obviously, we're on week three, and I'm sitting down while I preach. This is my third week to do this, which is a little bit difficult. Last week, I think I only stood up once, uh, which is... He paces a lot. I'm but, used to preaching, yeah. and uh, so we're doing this series together. It's about relationships, but not just husbands and wives. It actually has a lot to do with all relationships, and uh, we've kind of the whole purpose of the the, these four or five messages that we're doing is relationships require work, all relationships. Yeah. You're not going to be a good parent by accident. You're not going to be a good friend by accident. You're not going to be a good spouse by accident. You're not going to be a good employee or employer by accident. So it's, it's on us, and we've looked at this the past couple of weeks. The Bible says, through wisdom, a house is built. So we have to take the knowledge of God and then let that become a foundation that we build our relationships on because storms come. Jesus told us that. And if not relationships, they collapse and they, they fall. So week one, we just, we, we've been talking about things that we had to learn. And we had to learn uh, a lot that, that, yeah, a lot. <laughs> that, that uh, boys and girls are different, right? And for the first few years, I didn't understand that. I thought that she was supposed to be like me. And I was trying to change her instead of learn from her. And she's trying to, she's trying to change me instead of learn me. But we had to realize, hey, we're, we're created by God. He created us male and female, right? So there's some differences there. Last week, we yeah. looked at that we had to learn how to communicate without yelling because we got to where it's easy to yell at your kids and yell at each other and yell at the people, just yell, 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 yell. But we had to learn to bring the, bring the volume down, the tone down, and, and communicate in a more healthy way. And it took us a decade to figure some of these things out. We're slow learners, and we teach the Bible, it's amazing, right? Don't, don't hate on us. But it took a solid decade for us to, to stop like, hey, let's not yell. Let's just talk and let's, let's, let's figure it out. And uh, so even this week, a noble walked in. He says, don't yell. I said, I'm not yelling. This is not a yell. But so you're raising uh, the tone of your voice to he communicate He was just trying importance. to pin my preaching back on me. Like, noble's, noble's trying to catch me. Uh, so but last week was, was don't yell. This week, if you got your worship guide, we'll give you a couple of blanks. Uh, this is something that we had to learn, and it was prioritizing fun or prioritizing uh, relaxation. And I say re- you can either write relaxation, you can write rest, or you can write fun because different people consider it different things. For some people, uh, fun is sitting on a beach and relaxation. Other people, fun is going hiking. I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, but for some people, uh, rest is like getting out there and sweating and stuff like that. I'm more of the persuasion that rest well, is Well, that's because we live in rest. Louisiana. And yes, so to hike hot. in Louisiana, yeah, you have hot. a million mosquitoes on you or following you. Yes, so it doesn't yes. work as good. Yes. It's I mean, true. I love AC. <laughs> Glory to God in the highest. <laughs> yes. So, but, but whether, whether you want to call it relaxation or resting or whatever you want to call it, we learned early on that we're going to have to prioritize time together. As parents, we're going to have to prioritize times with our kids. Even, even as now, as overseers and with, with people that work with us, we prioritize in taking time with the lead team in here and getting together outside of the church and eating crawfish or doing something like that. And... Uh, the, uh, what you do in the good time carries you in the bad times. So, so the good times become glue that holds you together so you don't fall apart in the bad times. And a lot of times, uh, relationships, you, you don't have enough good times to hold you together whenever things get bad and things get rocky. But they do. They get bad, and, and they, they, don't, they aren't always... Good. So we've always prioritized. Well, and even when you think about in the workplace, um, if you have a, a staff that works together and they're together a lot, when you spend time outside of just working on the projects, there is a camaraderie and a unity that is built whenever you are just fellowshipping together. I mean, Jesus would fellowship with the disciples on the beach. He shared a meal, and then later you would hear the disciples refer back to, hey, remember that time we were on the beach with Jesus? There's a camaraderie and a unity that's built in those times. That, like he said, for us, we think of it like glue that glues you together, that when you have storms of life, life, it will help you to stick whenever you're banking that time spent together. Um, it helps you. Hey, so we brought a couple pictures. Show me a picture. Oh. Do you know which ones I, I sent? Um, let's see. 
Yeah. Oh, that was uh, that was the first time I killed a, a deer, and I ate that deer. So I'm not. I don't believe in. If you're not a hunter, I apologize. Um, I don't I, apologize. He was good. Listen, he was delicious. I won't kill anything that I don't I eat. If we're not, we rolled him in if, buttermilk. If you're not going to eat and it, flour and fried that he was deer delicious. right there. But it's you guys not a don't. He, it's a girl. It's I know a girl. that's a doe. That's a girl deer. Do you remember what you shot it with? I don't Just remember. Say gun. It was a gun. I know <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a bow. I haven't I haven't gotten that. Do you remember what it was? Long. Was it a 12 gauge? Yeah. Huh? It was buckshot. Buckshot. You remember that? Yeah. You shot that deer with buckshot. I shot, shot that deer with buckshot. Boom. And I gut shot it. Now, I remember that. That was horrible. Because yeah, because I killed it, I had to clean it. Yeah. And your cousins were all standing around laughing because I'm dry heaving as I'm trying to pull the britches off that deer. Pull its britches off. That's I'm right. trying That's to pull the skin off. That's I'm what trying you to call pull it, y'all. Off. Just so y'all didn't know. Listen, it's we were in Mississippi. The, pulling so. the britches off of the animal. We What's funny is uh, we, uh, on this particular trip, we hunt in these little, this little metal house, you know, and it sits on the, sits on the ground. And the, one, the best part about deer hunting is napping. Uh, you get to sleep. Like, so we, we would sit there, and we were both sleeping, like really sleeping, and it started raining. Well, they had like old office chairs in this deer st- yeah, and the, house. The, the, the house was made out of tin. How many of y'all know rain on a tin roof is just like... Amen. From the Lord. It's, it's a blessing. It's from the Lord. Right, so we, I remember we were sitting there, and then it started raining really hard. And I remember I, w- I would wake up, and I'd think, man, it is really raining. But then we would both just go right back to sleep because you have to wear like nine layers of clothes. It's very unattractive. Uh, the whole process, you got we all these warm, clothes though. on. Yeah, we were warm, so we were sleeping. And, but I remember distinctively remembering a few times like... Man, it is really, really it rained all day. raining, mm-hmm. but we kept just sleeping. But I remember we were sitting there, and the house started to float that we were in. It started to rock, and, that's and when water he... was rising and coming up to, through our feet. He said, I think it's time to go. I was like, I think we have to leave because the river had overflowed its banks and our little shoot house was about to start getting washed down the river. And we were so cozy. But we went, and I was like, I think we had to get out of here. We were well, <laughs> really well rested for this escape that we had to go. So we walked through high water, mm-hmm. right? You remember that? And oh, then yeah. we got on the four-wheeler, and she wrapped her arms around me. And this is what, this is what you want, right? It's like, wrap those arms around me. I'm going to get us out of here. So we're riding the little four-wheeler, and it actually started to float to where the wheels so were I'm no really Really longer, holding on to the wheels now. were no longer on the ground. And you, I don't know if you've ever ridden in a car when it's floating. It ain't right. Like, you just know if the, if the wheels aren't on the ground, things aren't right. And the, the, I forget, I'll never forget, the four-wheelers started floating like this. And I'm thinking like, Oh my God! And I don't know what Help she's Lord. thinking. I didn't know any. I didn't know that we she were in that much. She probably thought this is what we do all the time. I, like so, this I was like, is he's hunting. Got it. I'm like, just holding on. No, this is not hunting. This is death. <laughs> like this is, this is not a good situation. But thank God, somehow I don't know. We found some you found pavement, ground. found ground, and 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 we got out. Right, made it. we made it. High five yeah. on making it out. <laughs> Thanks. Right? But listen, that's probably what, 20 years, not 20, but I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. And yeah. these moments, literally, for me, they, uh, they become a raft, right? Because you're going you're gonna to be yeah. in situations where you get bombarded by things. But these moments like that, of, they were fun. It was, it was good it's in a weird way. It's funny what we call fun. But, but those, that time together, the time that we spent, um, it, it created memories that... We made it through something together, and we laugh about it now. We still laugh about it when we talk about it, but that has become a glue for us. And so for us, we've always prioritized um, time. It's not. Uh, we used to go to the grocery store, and he would uh, we'd pick out flowers that we would give to each other, and stand there, and he'd hand me the flowers, and I'd be like, "Oh, these are so pretty. Let's put them back and go get our groceries." You know, we'd stand there for just a minute because I just we didn't want. Well, and the flowers were going to die. But the yeah, thing I'd is, say, we, this is what I would get you if I was going to get you flowers. If I was going to get you but flowers. We're going to go get milk and eggs instead. Whenever we got married, we lived in Section 8 housing. And the way you live in Section 8 housing is you qualify for it. And the way you qualify is because you, you make so little that they, you get qualified. So whenever we started, you know, I was working at Outback Waiting Tables in Bible College. She was working at the church, weren't making a lot of money, and we're broke. School, yeah. We lived on one Butler Road in a two-story Section 8 apartment. They wouldn't let us paint the walls. They painted them for you. 
That's the type of house it was. It was like, yeah, we're going to paint the walls for you. Well, what color? You'll see. Like, there was no picking it out, right? That's, sure. that's, and then the first house we bought was a two-bedroom, one-bath uh, garden district, which just means older home. They, they tell you it's the garden district. Vintage. No, that means it's older. That Vintage. means it was built like at the turn of the century, right? Uh, and it's cold in there, right? And it, we paid fifty-eight nine for our first house and so proud that we bought that house. But, but we had friends that worked at the same place that we worked, and they built brand new homes. But we made a decision together as a couple that, that said, I would rather live in a smaller home with a small note and us be able to take trips and go on vacations and go out to eat instead of drop all of my money in a mortgage and us be stressed out and not have fun. So for the first, and we still do this to this day, whenever we move down here to start the church, a lot of work goes into it, a lot going on. We're knocking door to door, handing out flyers. Will you come to our church? No, please. No. Okay. <laughs> Go to the next house, right? And my kids were three and five, but we, and, and they would get frustrated because we were always doing church stuff. But one, one Saturday, I guess, we put them in the car, and we were like, we've got to go to, we've got to drive two hours to do church counseling or something. We lied to them. Uh, I know that's terrible, but get over it. Uh, we, we said, we've got to go. Somebody died or something. We've got to go do a funeral. And they were so disappointed to have to ride in the car for two hours to go do a death or something like that. I know you don't do a death, but whatever. You understand what I'm saying. But we pulled up at the port of Galveston, and there was a Disney, a, a cruise. Disney cruise. And they got out of the car, and they looked at that boat. And I, I would give a million dollars. I don't have a million. But I would give a million dollars to, to have that three-year-old little face look up at me again. And I said, we're going to go get on that boat with Cinderella. I was the greatest dad on the planet at that moment. That right? But it was a stretch for us. We weren't killing it. But I mean, we weren't. But we prioritize. Come on, how many of you know you find the money that you want to spend on whatever you want to spend it for? Come on, you're going to spend 150 on a rod and reel, or you can spend 150 at two nights at the La Quinta in Galveston and bring your kids somewhere. We just always really prioritize, like, hey, uh, I'd rather have memories than money. And I believe we serve a God that's good enough that you can have both. I do. I believe that the Lord will bless you in the city and bless you in the field, bless you coming in, bless you going out, make you the head, not the tail, above yeah. only and not beneath. Amen. He said this is, this is what he tells us in Deuteronomy 28. But in all the seasons of our life, whether we were at Section 8 or in the Garden District or starting a church with nothing, we always prioritized and made it a point that we were going to have moments like this to build rafts in the hard times. And to be the glue that held us together whenever things didn't go well. And I'm going to show you in scripture that this is not just an idea of two people sitting on a stage. No, this is the word of God. Yeah. If you go all the way back to Genesis, God worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. But then on the seventh day, he actually enjoyed the garden that he created. And I mean, I know a lot of times we get away from this. We just work and work and work and work and work and never work step back and say, hey, it's good. We never step back with the Adam and the Eves of our lives and walk mm -hmm. with them in the garden in the cool of the day. And yet this is what he established in the book of beginnings. And Genesis is a blueprint of God's original design. And we know that sin messed all of it up. But his original design was that there was a Sabbath to enjoy the garden. To actually eat the fruit of your labor sure. and not just always being laborious in, in our life. So I, we're going to look at a few scriptures just to show you in the Old Testament and in the New Testament why this is important. Yeah, Nehemiah 8.10, uh, this is where Ezra is talking to him and he says, uh, and we've heard this scripture before, but he's talking to him, he's telling him, it's time to feast, it's time to celebrate. And he says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength Amen. And your stronghold. That's, That's what good. the Amplified Bible says. The joy of the Lord is your strength. We've heard that before. And strength actually means in the Hebrew a place or a means of safety or protection. So when you enter into that joy that the Lord has for you, then you are entering into a place of safety or a place of protection for your life. It also means defense or fortress. It even, even means helmet. Good. Isn't that interesting? The joy of the Lord is your strength, or the joy of the Lord is your helmet. And I was really thinking about this scripture because the enemy comes against you with thoughts 
about how you've missed it, you've messed up. So when you have your helmet on, it deflects those thoughts, the negative thoughts that the enemy brings. When you're in that place of joy, when you're tapping into the joy of the Lord that is on the inside of you once you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then the word stronghold, it means a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. So think about that. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your stronghold. It is your place that has been fortified. So when you you spend time, and I have to do this on purpose, because it can be easy to, to look at life and look at our circumstance and our situation and start to get negative. But when you can look at your situation and your circumstance and you look for the good in it, you say, well, I know this isn't what I planned, but I still believe the word of God. I still believe that the goodness of God is going to come out of this situation. I still believe that God is for me and not against me. And as you start to do that, you tap into that joy on the inside and it becomes that fortified place that you enter into when attacks come. And I know for us, we have absolutely seen it in our life. So I I don't, the only thing with a lot of these scriptures we're going to talk about for me when I hear some of them and he's talking about um, eat drink and be merry you know that's what the King James says and this a lot of times people take that scripture and they just run with it out of context you know and they just fall into debauchery and that's not exactly that's not at all what he's talking about we're about to look at some times where the Lord he instituted feast he said this is mandatory my people must celebrate and must have feasts. And he had seven mandatory feasts. And I'm going to let you get into that a little bit more. But whenever they were doing it, they're celebrating. And the Lord is the heart of the celebration. Yeah. So a lot of times people want to celebrate, but not with the Lord. You know, they, they leave him in the church house on Sunday. Uh, and I've done it before. You understand? I, I hear, but I, I, I something on the inside of me scratches because our culture has become a a culture that will take just pieces that they want to hear and leave the rest. But when you look at the whole thing in context, they are celebrating and they are feasting about the goodness of God in their life. So go ahead. Tell us about the Old Testament. Actually, God mandated a feast, seven of them. He said these seven feast or annual feast and you have to keep them. He didn't even make it an option. And, and it's interesting, uh, God commands us to enjoy life. You know, we always think of God like commanding us, thou shalt not kill. But actually here, seven different times, he says, these are seven feasts that you have to keep. In addition to these, the, in the Old Testament, there are actually scripture references, I don't have time to go into all of them, that if something good happened, they would have a party. They would have a feast. How many of y'all in the New Testament, when the prodigal came home, what did the daddy do? The daddy said, man, let's kill the fatted calf, and we are going to celebrate. Whenever a- uh, Abraham and Laban and these people in the Old Testament, whenever something good happened, they celebrated. They thought that it was, it was, it was worth the time and the effort to get together and actually enjoy some things. There were seven different times, though, in the Old Testament when God said, hey, there's a feast for the Passover. And that's whenever you got passed over, right? There's the feast of the unleavened bread. There's the feast of booths. And I'm not, I'm not going to talk about all these. But there's the feast of trumpets. There's the feast of the, the day of atonement. The day that you, your sins are atonement. And he required them. He says, hey, this is a time whenever y'all are to kill a delicious lamb. Yes. Roasted lamb, right? He said, this is a time whenever you're supposed to get the family together, get people together, and actually enjoy the fruit of the labor. And it was mandated. So these were annual types of things. And then there was also the weekly types of things, which was what we call the Sabbath, right? He said, keep the Sabbath. Why? Because he said, how many of y'all know that the Lord doesn't need a Sabbath? I mean, I know he says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not, I'm neither weary, I don't faint. I mean, come on, God doesn't need a break. God didn't give the Sabbath because he's like, I'm wore out. No, he's the only self-energizing entity in the universe of universes. I mean, I know the sun doesn't need a break. It doesn't need to, but, but God didn't need the Sabbath. He gave it to who? He gave it to you. He gave it to men. He gave it to so that kids can have their family back, have mom and daddy back and go do something. He gave it to spouses. He gave it to employees and employers. Actually, he gave it to the land. In the Old Testament, he would actually say there were certain years where he said, no crops. We're going to let the land rest. Well, if the land needs a break, how many of y'all think you need one? Yes. We're all going on vacation, y'all. That's... (laughs) 
Come on, but I'm serious. If God's mandating these things, weekly rest, quarterly rest, annual rest, come on, this is something that we prioritize early on as something like, hey, we're going to actually enjoy some things uh, and, and, and make some memories, and I'm glad we did, and I'm glad we still do. Where are we going this year? Uh, wherever you want to go. You're where home is. <laughs> there you Thanks. go. Hey, uh, let me give you a couple more verses uh, this morning, and then in your worship guide, we're just going to give you some real uh, action-type things that you can implement. Hey, I know this is practical, but if you aren't careful, life gets away from you. If you aren't careful, the only time you see your kin folks is at a funeral. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a reality. And if you aren't careful, it's too? like uh, you, you got 30 years. Like my dad, my dad put in 35 years at Union Pacific Railroad. And he would work, you know, he would work 40, 45 days with no off days. Then he would take what was called a personal day. And then he'd work another 45 days. He lived in, while we lived in Alexandria, he lived in Arkansas in a travel trailer for two and a half years. I would see him just a couple times a year. And, and he did that uh, to put food on the table. And he did that because he, he felt like to sustain the lifestyle that they uh, that, that my parents had and all those types of things. But I won't, I'll never forget the day that we were sitting outside and they had put in a pool. Because when you work like that, you do make money. No doubt about it. When you work like that, when you're a grinder, you do stack some stuff in the bank. But he was out there cleaning the pool and he said, 40 more days until I retire. 40 more days till I retire. And then he was counting them down and I was home at the time. We were living in Alexandria. And he got down to maybe 29 days. 29 days until I retire. And then, But they took him off the train in Bunky because he was hurting so bad. And come to find out, long story short, he basically had cancer from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. He was absolutely ate up with it. So he never made his, uh, his 29 days. And they had already booked a trip to one of these things where you, you for like 30 days, you're going to go all the way around, not all the way around the world, but, but they, that whenever they're moving a ship from the top of the earth down to the bottom of the earth for maintenance or whatever, you can ride on these boats. So they, they were going to do like a 30-day cruise they'd already paid for. He never took that cruise. He never made it, never made it on the boat. We put him in the ground. That's where he went. And after 35 years of investing all of that, that, that I'd already made a decision with my wife that we were going to live a little bit different. And I'm thankful for all the sacrifices that both my parents made. Uh, we were actually talking about this last night. It seems like a few generations ago, people had like nine brothers and sisters, ten brothers and sisters. And they all worked in the field together. They all worked in the factory together. But then the next generation wanted a better life than the life that their parents had. So then they all went into the women, went into to the workplace and the men went into the workplace and the boomers came home and they went to work right that's what they did so they there wasn't as much home time as much home life at least is my perspective and then now it does seem like that I know that a lot of the people that I'm friends with in the church and around the church we do spend a lot of time with our kids now like you're always with yours and I'm always with mine so I think that's good and that's healthy and I'm not saying any generation's wrong or right or whatever but I know from my perspective I hate that my dad and mom never got to take that cruise you know, I hate that he lived in a travel trailer for three years to help put us through school and all that type of stuff. So, but we're, we're all young enough to make the adjustments now. And even if you are working 712s or, or 610s, you know, we're in plant country where you do have to work these weird schedules. I'm just saying, hey, if we have to prioritize where we spend our time or you're going you're gonna to stack it up, but you're not going to get to enjoy it. Yeah. And, and we'll read in Ecclesiastes uh, we'll kind of end with that, but we'll give you some action steps here. So the first thing I would just tell you is prioritize or, or just write the word money because you, you have to schedule or allot money for this. And, and over the years, we've always heard people say, well, I, I can't afford it. Listen, I get it. Uh, there was a lot of times when we couldn't afford anything, so we would just do, uh, uh, we would go to the park, right, and go play Frisbee golf, and that was a train wreck. Because whenever I throw the Frisbee, it would just like land and roll and then roll left. You know, I'm horrible at Frisbee golf, right? And we bought these bikes that had a chain on it that was eight foot long chain. And they were like chopper bikes. They were so cool, right? And we would ride to TCBY and get white chocolate mousse with many, Those are date. With many we'll M&Ms. Yogurt store. White chocolate mousse with many M&Ms, right? So that was a cheap date. 
but, but we did it, right? So whether you're, if, even if you're broke, you can go, to the, go down here. We have a really nice boardwalk that you can go walk down and get you a Paul's Rib Shack rib. Just ask him for one rib if you can't buy a whole rack. <laughs> just say, can you, can you sell me a rib? But come on, anything's better than nothing. Yeah. But you have to process the way that we did it for years, and this is for years. And I still do stuff like this. I use Travel Zoo and Groupon and stuff like that. But for the first five years of our marriage, we went on a cruise every year. Because if you're on a cruise, you don't have to worry about money. Once you're on, baby, you get to eat as much as you want. So like on our honeymoon, we went to Acapulco because somebody had a timeshare. Yes. Uh, but, but there, it's like, all right, we got $500, so we got $100 a day. So we get $20 for breakfast, we get $30 for lunch, and we get $50 for... How I many y'all know that ain't no vacation right there? Because then you're mad at each other like, but I want another, I want another biscuit. And it's like, you can't have it. And it's like, we got to save this money for tomorrow. But on a boat, man, on a cruise, so for, I think it was five years We heard years ourselves on our first one. Oh, I gained 10 <laughs> pounds. I was like, I'm never stopping eating. It was amazing. But for like $3.99, we could get a seven-night out of of Houston or out of New Orleans and just drive down there, get on a boat, somebody keep the kids, and we were sailing, right? We so, but, but we prioritize our money, and, and so we always, every year, we would take our tax income, and instead of paying bills with it, with our income tax money, we just, on that day that we got the refund hit, we booked our vacations, right? And once we had kids, we booked one for the children, and then one for us, and the one with the kids was never as good as ours, because they're not as important. Uh, it's not supposed to be they, for, yeah, for so, us so at, like, our, at our family. We're going to Biloxi with y'all. We're going to Jamaica. Like, that's, <laughs> <laughs> and they would get really upset. They're like, why can't we go to Jamaica? It was like, well, when you get married, you can go to Jamaica with your spouse. And maybe one day we'll all go together. But that's we're going funny. to Biloxi this year. You're going to Schlitterbahn. That's where you're going. <laughs> My daughter we're was driving telling me over last night. to night. My daughter was telling me last night. She's like, what about the beach in Hawaii? Do you want to take me there this year? No, I'm and taking I said, you there this no, year. No, but like, I'll take you to the beach beach, but not Hawaii. <laughs> we'll drive down to Biloxi or Galveston. Cause, and she's like, why? I said, because you're just not going to enjoy the beach as much as it's the thousands bored, of dollars it's bored. going to cost. Like, we can go to the water park bored. and the other beach. Yeah, it's true. So anyway, so and, and listen, as, as you age and you get more money or whatever, then, ch- then things can change and you can do more and take your whole family or do all these types of things or whatever. But for us, money's, if money's an issue, then you have to prioritize it. The second one is, uh, the second number two, is do things that your spouse likes. So when there's we some things. Hunting. My wife's not a big hunter, like yeah. a big deer hunter. She liked to go and we take naps and that was cool. But she did that because I enjoyed that. There's certain yeah. things that my wife enjoys that I go do with her. There's certain things that she enjoys that, that, that she'll do with me. There's certain things that we do apart from each other, right? There's certain things that I don't do. I do it with the boys, right? Go play golf or whatever. And she goes to get her nails done or hair done. So it's important for you to have things that you, you rest, relax, have fun by yourself together with your girlfriends. If you're single, if you're widowed. If you're whatever, there's certain things that you do. Uh, her and her mom just took a, took a trip overseas this year. Had a, had a difficult time with her dad's passing and stuff like that. And then they went, where'd y'all go? Israel. Israel. And, and Greece. And Greece. That was a blessing, right? Yeah. So there was memories was made there that, was a, that, that, that helped bond and things happened there. One of the last things Jesus did is he got all of his people around and he said, I'm not going to be here very much longer. And he took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, which was given to you. I mean, y'all know they never forgot that. Come on, it's still painted all over the place, right? The Last Supper, right? What, what was that Last Supper? There was a bonding and a gel that solidified in that room. Things happened. Whenever he took, and he took that robe and he got down and he started washing those disciples' feet. What's he doing? He's not just giving them a list of to-dos. No, no, no. He, there is a, 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 a chemical, emotional reaction that's happening between the master and the servant. Yeah. And whenever you get together with your coworkers or your kids or your spouse or who Whoever, your friends, there's something that happens there that's really important beyond just your 401k. And we all love a good 401k, right? But there are other things that that are going on. We really have to work hard, too, in our culture now because we're so digitally minded and we want to text. But the time, the face-to-face time spent together, the personal one-on-one, close enough, you know, to where you can high-five them or handshake them, that time is invaluable. Like you said, it, it it's better than a text, you know. So the first one is prioritize your money. Number two is just be flexible or do something that maybe is not your favorite thing. And then, 
the last one, number three. I just went blank. Isn't that terrible? It's okay. I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 8.15. So I recommend having fun because there is nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work that God gives them under the sun. Amen. Number three, schedule it. That's what I was going to say. Because we schedule it. Friday for us is family night for us. We don't let a lot of things interfere with that. Uh, And we always, we schedule a... Uh, at the beginning of the year, we schedule to start scheduling our vacations. Once income tax money, whatever comes in, we put things on the calendar because what gets calendar gets done. And if it doesn't get calendared, I can tell you, usually by the end of the year or by the years go by, and you're like, man, we didn't have one to spend the night out. So we try to, and we don't do this. I wish we did. Like once a quarter for us, go stay the night somewhere, go spend the night somewhere. Now, it, honestly, it happens about once a Twice a year, not four times a year, right? But we do, we do try to schedule times whenever we're together. We schedule times with our team here at the church where we're doing crawfish bowl or something like that. The men, we schedule pig roast and stuff like that. So prioritize your schedule, prioritize your money. The last thing I want to read you is in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And we're going to read this in verse number 4. If you know anything about Ecclesiastes, it's written by Solomon. And everybody knows Solomon's incredibly wise and all that. Solomon wrote several books in the Bible. One of them is called Song of Solomon, which is all about relationships and sex and love. It's all ooey-gooey. Proverbs is all about practicalities and stuff. Ecclesiastes is about uh, Solomon at this point in his life. He's acquired a lot. He's been super successful. But now that he is aging, he's looking back at his life and realizing a lot of the stuff that he invested in wasn't uh, maybe his best investment. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse number 4, I love this. They'll put it up on the screens behind me, and I'm reading the New Living Translation, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. He says, I tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, and I filled them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect water to irrigate my flourishing groves. I bought slaves, men and women and others that were born into my household. I owned large herds and flocks more than any other kings who've ever lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and I had beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for my labors. But as I look at everything I worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Verse 18. He says, so I came to hate all my hard work here on earth. For I must leave it to others, everything that I earned. And who can tell me whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I gained with my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. Some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, and then they must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Doesn't that sound like 2020? It sounds like the time that we're living in. How many of y'all know some things never change? And this is a guy that said, I got concubines, I got money, I got houses, I got reservoirs, I have all of this stuff, and I have anxiety. He says, he says what do people get in for all their anxiety? He says, their days of labor are filled with pain and grief, and even at night, their minds cannot rest. It's all meaningless. So I decided, this is his conclusion, nothing is better than to enjoy food and drink and find satisfaction in work. And then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from Him? So at the end of it, he says, hey, I really learned that what's, what's valuable is people. Being with people, eating with people, spending time with people, hanging out with people, making memories with people. Because I can't bring the reservoirs or any of the other stuff with me. 
The only what, what really, really counts is the relationships. And I can tell you, as people that do funerals quite often and stuff like that and go to hospitals, we had four different situations just this week within our church of hospital-type situations. And I know Don and Pat who do hospice and stuff like that. Whenever you're standing around people that are going through those types of moments in life, the only thing they're talking about is their relationship with God and their relationship with people. Yeah. That's it. They're not saying, hey, somebody, somebody, don't forget, put oil in the boat. And nobody cares about the boat. Yeah. The only thing those people are talking about is what's my relationship with God like and what's the relationship with people like? Am I estranged from my kids? Am I estranged? Will they love? Do they know this? Do they know that? What, what's going on? That's the only thing people care about. And it's the same thing Solomon said, that I've learned that what really matters is people. But this is just like the whole overarching thing is it, it, it won't happen by accident. Relationships have to be intentional for them to be successful. That's the only way that it really, truly works. Everybody, close your eyes. We'll pray together. Hallelujah. God, thank you for your word.